From Microbe TV, this is Office Hours for Wednesday, November 8th, 2023. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and welcome to your little viral corner of the internet. Joining me tonight from Montreal, Canada, Angela Mingarelli. Welcome, Angela. Thank you for having me. And for, for having me, I'm excited to to meet some of the regulars and answer lots of questions. Hopefully, I I do twiv good justice. Um, yeah, I was so about to say the weather, but we don't talk about the weather here. I was going to yeah, say you it's could one talk degree. about the weather. What's it like? <laughs> it's here? One it's cold, right? <clears throat> yeah, it's thirty three F. When I was C. there, it was pretty cold. Let's see what is it here? Eight degrees C, so a little warmer. <clears throat> yes, we're all wearing black. Doreen says, I'm wearing a McGill hoodie, McGill Physiology, which is my department. Cool. Yeah, both yeah. black. We didn't plan on it, though. It just happened. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank our moderators before we do anything else tonight. We have Barb Mac UK. We have Vanity Nutrition. We have Steph SF and Tom Steinberg. Thanks, all of you, for helping make this a, a civilized place where people can come and chat and learn about uh, viruses. Steph is wearing black too. Okay. Anybody else <laughs> wearing black? I decided that it's, as it gets chilly, I like wearing turtlenecks and well, they're just, they're black. That's the way it goes. And turtlenecks always look good. I love you turtlenecks. You think? Yeah. It was, it was the Steve Jobs look. True. Right. And with the blue glasses, it looks good. <laughs> Thank you. And Steve Jobs with uh, jeans. I don't have blue jeans, but I have, I started to wear Dockers, which is a kind of jean that's thin, thin legged. I, I, I used to always wear khaki pants and I got so tired of it. So that's mm -hmm. where I am now. So folks, tell us where you're from so we can show Angela, uh, the, the amazing breadth of people that we have here. I know that, um, <clears throat> Steph is in San Francisco, of course. Coralie is from New South Wales, Australia. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll uh, <clears throat> uh, see you next year. I'm going to Australia twice, Coralie. I'm sorry about my voice tonight. I have a little um, <laughs> I have a frog in my throat. <laughs> <laughs> a frog. Tom is from Oregon, one of our moderators. Did you go to the... Top Vincent, oh, where are you at? Where are you reading this? Because I'm trying to go in order to say hi. I'm just so I pick individual ones and I just click on them. Oh, and they okay. show up here. You can see they show up here on the mm -hmm. on the stream. I see Lori is from Ontario, Canada. There That's are multiple right. people from Canada. Someone else from Toronto. Where did it go? <laughs> John oh, Brian from... Silverman. Hi from yeah. Montreal. I wonder if that's our Brian that we met with. Probably. How many Brian's are in Montreal? I don't know. I'm sure there are plenty. <laughs> True. That are watching this um, this live stream? Probably not yeah. that many. Lisa's is from Columbus, Ohio. PGL is from Massachusetts. Let's see. Yeah. Joseph is from Ontario. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Who else? I know everyone is Encinitas, California, Buffalo, New York. Hmm. Hat is from Los Angeles. Oh, I'm just are. reading random ones here. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Somebody from Calgary, um, Mahar G uh, Gakim. I'm not sure how to say that, but from Calgary, Alberta also. Probably yeah. colder there than it is here. <laughs> Salvatore Cucinata. You like that name, Angela? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, he's. <laughs> I wonder if he's Italian. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. I wonder. <laughs> Madison, Wisconsin. Here we got Tech Lori's from Texas. <clears throat> Angry Penguin is from Toronto. <laughs> oh, Whoever God. that is. <laughs> Montreal, Brian. Yeah, it is Brian. I think that's Brian who we met. So we met uh, after, after I, I visited Montreal and McGill last week. And uh, we met Brian and Artemis, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was great meeting them. Yeah. 
Oh, Karen is here. Greetings, not from the incubator. <laughs> oh, Karen is a resistance. There she is. Yeah. Yeah. She told me she was going to come, come say hi. <clears throat> Claire is from the UK. And Carol is our favorite nephrologist from Southern California. Oh, nice. Uh, Hello, Carol. Mar Mar Marty is from uh, Toronto. I think you already pointed her out. Hartford, Connecticut. Surrey. I guess BC is British Columbia. Is that right? Yeah. Well, if it's, yes. Yeah, BC. We also have Un somebody from Ecuador, Guayaquil, which is Hans Collin. Interesting. Hans Collin from Ecuador. I speak he, Spanish, so I'm trying El, to throw it in there. <laughs> Elcio is from Brazil. Nice. Cleveland, Ohio. Montreal. Oh, there's Artemis. Oh, you know, now I recognize the handle. I've seen this many times. And there it is. You see it there on the what? screen underneath me? And, uh, oh, yeah, what? Artemis. This, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> So we met uh, Brian and Artemis in Montreal last week, right? Yeah, Vincent came to McGill. That episode will be dropping in a few weeks. Boulder, Colorado, Sweden. Nice. Los Angeles, Hartford, Connecticut, north of Boston. Here's Kip and Laura from San Francisco, Tucson, Arizona, Elgin, Illinois, Free the frog in my throat. I, I don't know how to do it. <laughs> Sorry. I got water. I have water here. I can do that. Salt Lake City. Here you go. You said this one. Calgary, Alberta. Right. That was the name you had. Hmm. Trouble. <clears throat> Bur Burbank, California. Portland, Oregon. Here we go. Noir is in Santa Fe. And this one. Look at this. Singapore. <laughs> oh, wow. That's pretty far 28C. away. 28C. So warm. <laughs> <laughs> That's 82F, actually. That's the one where you can reverse them and you get... <laughs> How cute. Vanity's out on Long Island. Elizabeth West, Virginia. And Brian Silverman says, yes, he's the Brian we met. Oh, uh, perfect. Hello again, Doreen. Brian and Artemis. <laughs> Doreen is from Elgin, Illinois. Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. Hampton, Virginia. Did you say Guayaquil, Ecuador already? Mm-hmm. You did, okay. I was jumping Ch ahead. <laughs> Chile, Cape Cod, San Jose. Questella's from uh, Ohio, I know that. Questella's been around since the very beginning. Oh, username mm -hmm. is my name backwards. Mike, <laughs> can you read names backwards? I got Mike, M-I-K-E, G-R-A-H. Uh -huh. Garmaham? Gr Graham. Gr Graham. 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 Oh, Graham. <laughs> you know, it's hard to read words backwards. I was that? dyslexic, so it should be easier for me. But <laughs> All right. So Dennis is uh, my video critic from Nebraska. He's a TV guy, and he always criticizes uh, my video. So he says it's acceptable tonight. Okay, thank you. Uh, is I my video that. okay, Dennis? I feel like my <laughs> MacBook is less... <laughs> Less quality for sure than Vincent's camera. He has a beautiful camera. Mike is from Seattle. Jill is from Wilmington, originally from North Jersey. Well, I was born in Patterson, New Jersey, and grew up in North Jersey in Bergen County. Look at this, Guatemala. And we have Auckland, New Zealand. Cool. Oh, wow. It's already tomorrow oh, there. China. <laughs> Look at this. Uh, isn't that incredible? <laughs> Will, greetings. Uh, Paso Robles, you know, the great wine they make there in Paso Robles. Oh, yeah. Uh, look at Haider is from Fortaleza, Brazil. I work at Albert Sabin Children's Hospital. That's very cool. Shell is from Santa Rosa. Cherry is from the Lake District in the UK. Visto is from Sydney, Australia. Angela, are you impressed at the breadth of people visiting here tonight? There's literally every, well, we don't have Africa yet. I don't think anybody is from Africa, but we have every other content. I think I was thinking we got North America, South America. We got Australia, Asia, Europe. Mm. We need some, someone from Africa, please, <laughs> if you're there. So, um, you know, as everyone knows, Angela is a host on 
Twiv, and she's a veterinarian. So get your veterinarian questions ready. I have a few mm-hmm. other things I want to talk about first. So uh, as Angela said, I visited uh, McGill last week. I just realized the name of the seminar series is ETOH, ethanol. Yeah. <laughs> <Did> you... <laughs> yeah. But of course, that's the whole, it's like a cute play on words, emerging topics in health. <laughs> So funny because I they gave me a pointer as a gift in the box that says ethanol on it. So mm-hmm. I gave we did a twiv and let me show you some pictures here from that visit. We did a twiv and I gave it. So there's the twiv. It's a nice setup. Remember, Angela, it was good. Oh yeah, it was cute. So yeah. and we we put our little banner here. We put micro TV on the screen. So tell remind me who are the people from from you over. So remember? we have right next to me is Jesse Shapiro. So he's right. in the, the, both of these professors are in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. So Jesse Shapiro and then next to him is Sana Naderi. She's a PhD student in his lab. Then next to her is Anshul Sinha. He's in Corinne Morris's lab, uh, which is next next to you, Vincent. She's next to you, Corinne Morris. Right. Um, and she does a lot of stuff in phages. Uh, Jesse also does some SARS-CoV-2 work, although most of his lab does uh, bacterial work. But at McGill, it's actually surprising. We don't have a lot of virologists. Like it's hard to find, like there's no like hardcore virologist at McGill anymore as far as Hmm. I did like my research. It wasn't wasn't easy to find. So you can see here the, um, how we record these things. There's a camera there that gets a wide shot and then we have the recorder for all the, uh, the microphones, and then there's another camera that zooms in on people, and and Karen mm-hmm. uh, is uh, our road person, is uh, doing the cameras. Okay, so that is one. Here's another picture. This was lunch. I had lunch with a bunch of fellows and students. That was a lot oh, of fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> then so for uh, my lab, there were some people from my lab there as well. I know everyone in this picture. <laughs> <laughs> You're all from. <laughs> They were really excited to meet Vincent, yeah. Uh, let's see, we have, oh, the, tell them what this is, this piece of equipment, Angela. <laughs> this is so cool. Oh, it's a, <laughs> that's a two photon microscope. Yeah, that's our microscope on, on our floor where we can take images. We can do live imaging, so intravital imaging. We can also do like slices of uh, different tissues. So most of the time we're working with mouse tissues, um, but it's really cool, the table itself, has like a pneumatic. So if you like press on the table, it'll absorb any vibrations. So it sounds like a kind of like a spaceship. It's like the air goes in and out in case there's any sort of, you know, earthquake or somebody slams the door really hard. It won't screw up your imaging. Mm. So it's it's a very expensive machine, right? Yeah. It's like a couple million dollars. (laughs) Amazing. Just amazing. All right. So that's that. What else we got? There's another view of TWIV from my uh, perspective. Everybody chatting oh, yeah. there. And then Angela and me just before we got started. <laughs> Cute. That's it. Okay, so that, that's, that was last week. Um, just yesterday, I went, I went to the Harvard Club in New York City, Angela, for lunch. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah, all these big uni- all these universities have clubs. And right across the street <laughs> from the Harvard Club was the Penn Club. Anyway, I went there because... It was a fundraiser for a school in Washington, D.C. called the Chance Academy, which was founded by Anna Bernanke. And she is the wife of Ben Bernanke, who got the Nobel Prize uh, in economics very recently. And he was the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank under Obama. So pretty okay. big guy. But his uh, mm-hmm. wife, uh, Anna, founded this academy where they educate kids who would never have a chance to go to school. It's it's free for them and they provide a nice, you know, welcoming environment, non-hostile, and she needs to raise money. So she know I know her and so she wanted me to come and and uh, be her resident virologist, right? So I sat next to her and uh, that's cool. <laughs> it was really fun. I met a lot of people who have great sums of money. <laughs> and yeah, I was going to say lots of <clears throat> lots of potential donors. Lots of I mean, potential. I talked to a lot of them. I gave my cards out and said, you know, we do this. And um, Anna and I were go- are going to do a fundraiser together probably in Washington at some point 
it's because our, our goals are similar. We want to educate everyone without any bias. And so we think we could raise money together. So uh, that'll be fun to do. But the, people are all very smart. It's, it's fun to be um, amongst them. But she said, you know, in this room, everybody went to good schools. The kids we educate, they wouldn't have any chance to do that unless they go to a good school. And so that's what mm -hmm. they want to do. I think this is a wonderful goal. And um, I hope that she was able to raise some money. Yeah, that's next, amazing. <clears throat> next week, uh, we are going to Phoenix. <laughs> What's in Phoenix? A ASMQ, the Conference of Undergraduate Educators. It's a conference to bring undergraduate educators together and talk about approaches and techniques and so forth. And uh, we're going to do a This Week in Microbiology there. And that should be fun. So it, most of you are not going to be at the meeting, but we'll be there. I'm going to take Karen and um, Ray Ortega will be there. Ray, you may have met at TWIV 1000, uh, Angela, remember? Yeah, I remember <laughs> Ray. He was really nice. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what we have here for some questions. Let's see. we got all the beginning stuff. Uh, so this is interesting. Marianne is in Norway. Angela's sister Chiara was on Robinson Erhardt's podcast a little while ago. Do you know this podcast, uh, Angela? I haven't um, actually. My sister is on a lot of podcasts, I have to say, but this really? one I did not. She sends, so we have like a family WhatsApp group, and she'll send like links to different podcasts and stuff, but not always, not everything necessarily. Um, but I haven't actually listened to this, but I will. I'll write it down. I'll check it out. Uh, Kiara's on a lot of stuff. She loves science communication. She's very, she does a lot of outreach. So um, she does stuff like every week. <laughs> well, where is she now? She's in Yale, New Haven, right? Yeah. Yeah. She's at Yale. She just started in September. She's loving it. <laughs> Tom writes, uh, with respect to TWIV 1059, Ebola virus uses tunneling nanotubes as an alternate route of dissemination, JID, September 2023. So that's kind of related to that paper we did, Angela, where somehow mm -hmm. it gets from cell to cell. And here, apparently, it, it's a nanotube that does it. Wow. So, so it is. Okay. So then it was kind of what we were saying, Rich, like with... um. How he was saying some pox viruses do it, right? There's like a almost like a, a vesicle that then there's like a momentary tube that's formed between two cells. That's what we were saying, I think. Yeah, yeah. We decided on that. Yep. Well, this so, paper apparently, I'll have a look at it because I have to pick a paper for this Friday. <clears throat> that's what I do tomorrow on Thursday. Let's and see. T t Tom also says uh, the the earlier work was elegant, reminded me of recent Amy paper uh, on cross-reacting enteroantibodies. Yeah. Two very nice papers. Amy does good work. She was well trained. <laughs> <laughs> right? Definitely. Okay, let's see. So uh, G Ferraro said, uh, hi, everyone. Lots have been asking for a veterinarian by name. I hope they know Angela. Look at all those animals she put in there. Right, isn't that cute? Do you see all the other Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> I'm not as efficient as you as looking through all of these comments. Bear with have me, people. Practice. There have we go. Practice. Yeah. <laughs> well, definitely. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if Angela's whole family is scientific or just her and her sister. Oh, we have to get your, you to tell your story. Yeah. So oh, yeah. Wa watching older Twiv, I discovered that Amy's parents were both biochemists. Yeah. Okay. So, Angela, tell us your story. So, I was born in <laughs> Ottawa. Ottawa, Canada, so Ontario, which is the province right next to where I am now. And I moved to Spain when I was 16, almost 17. So my dad's a mathematician, so you guys are right. There are several scientists in my family, but not everyone. Uh, my mom's actually a nurse, and my dad's a mathematician. So he was on sabbatical for two years, and he decided to uproot my younger brother and I, because we were both uh still underage because i have six siblings there's seven <laughs> of us total <laughs> and the two of us the youngest we got taken to spain and we absolutely hated my father for this <laughs> at the time we thought it was a terrible idea we missed our friends we missed our family like our siblings but in the end after like six months uh, we started learning spanish because we didn't speak any spanish we spoke 
French and like some French and Italian, but no Spanish. So um, we learned Spanish when we moved there. Uh, and then, yeah, they moved back to Canada after two years and I decided to stay because I loved it in the end. And this is in the Canary Islands, I should say, because I said Spain, but specifically the Canary Islands. So they're an archipelago like off the coast of um, the Saharan Desert, actually. They're technically part of Africa because we're on the African continental shelf. Um, so yeah, so then I was in Spain and I went to vet school in Spain because I have Italian citizenship in case you're wondering how I did that. <laughs> so because when I was born, my dad got us Italian citizenship, I could go to school there. And, and then after I finished, I wasn't sure if I wanted to, I was very, so in like third year I started, cause I'm sure there'll be questions about, I think I saw one or two about like why I wanted to go into research versus like the clinical field. Um, and there's just a lot of things about research that was attractive to me because my sister is also an astrophysicist, um, astrophysicist, my father's a mathematician and they always kind of like planted the seed of curiosity in me. And I found, I didn't even really know what research was like before I, I knew, I always heard this word, but I never really even knew what it meant. Right. Until I went to university. Um, which I feel like a lot of people do a lot of people like think about research, but you don't really know what it is, but it seems cool. You're like, oh, okay, like people do things and then figure things out and spread the word kind of. <laughs> so when I was in third year, I remember studying like comparative anatomy and then immunology, like when we started learning immunology and I was like comparing different species, like interspecies uh, differences and then how similar we were as well, like different mammals. And then comparing that to birds, learning about, you know, the Bursa Fabrizio where B cells were first um, defined. And yeah, it was just very, I was just really fascinated by all of it. And, uh, when I finished vet school, it was either start a PhD or, uh, do a residency in anatomic pathology. So that's like, I love the microscope. So I love like looking on the microscope and like doing his, like looking at histological slices and looking at the immune cells and like how the architecture of the tissues where I love that so much, which most people, a lot of people, not most, but a lot of people hate histology and like looking at the microscope, but I thought it was so beautiful. Um, and I almost moved to the UK to do that, but then mm -hmm. I ended up moving to Montreal, uh, to my lab now, the Mandel lab at McGill. And our lab does a lot of T cell stuff. So T cell migration, but my PI, so my supervisor, she, she, when she did her PhD, did it in evolutionary virology. Um, and she actually worked with SIV. So simian immunodeficiency virus. Um, and she worked a lot with non-human primates and host, um, uh, responses and the pathogenesis of the virus. And then when she went on to do her PhD, she got more into like immune cell migration, but she always had this like, um, she always kind of wanted like a, it's not like a pet, like a side project, but kind of like when I started in the lab, she was also very interested in bats and in like bats as reservoirs of single stranded RNA viruses. And as all of us know, you know, SARS-CoV-2 probably comes from a bat. Uh, and she had written like multiple reviews on, on bat immunology. And she had this, uh, oh, sorry, my, my screen lagged. Never mind. Okay. Um, so yeah, so she had some stuff on bats. I thought that was really cool. The papers that she had on bats and I emailed her asking about potentially working in that because obviously the immune cell migration stuff at that time wasn't really interesting for me because I didn't really understand any of it. Um, but like the zoonotic spillover host pathogen responses seemed really cool. So yeah, so I started at the lab. She accepted me. Uh, this was during COVID. So I came to Canada in 2021, uh, sorry, uh, 2021, 2020, end of 2020. So it would have been like October, 2020. And then I started in the lab officially January, 2021. Uh, so it's been like three years and now my project has diverged. Now I still do bats. We're still looking at bats, but. Uh, we also do, I also do T cells now, but T cells are cooler now. Now that I understand more about them, they're cool. Uh, especially, um, allergic T cells, let's call them. I work in my research now has to do with, um, type two immunity. 
So, to, which is, is involves like allergic responses and parasitic responses. Um, it's like a specific type of T cell that's directed towards those things. So we're trying to figure out some mechanisms of why these cells exist and how they come to exist, basically. So when did you see me at the um, the bat meeting? Was that 2021 the summer or 22? That was 22, 22. Yeah, because I've been on TWIV now for just over a year. So that okay. would have been 22. Uh, yeah, basically I went to this infectious disease um, symposium for bats and I had, so when I started in the lab, we had this bulk RNA sequencing data set. So basically we had some samples from some bats in China that had been sent for sequencing. So we could look at bat versus humans response to like a bacterial toxin. And I analyzed the data set and then I presented my findings and Vincent was there and I was a fan of TWIV. I became a huge fan during the pandemic. I have to admit, I did not listen to TWIF pre-pandemic, but I did during the pandemic. Um, and then I saw him at breakfast one of the mornings. I was like, oh, that's Vincent Racaniello. And I was eating my breakfast and I was like, nah, I'm gonna just go up to him. I was like, I don't care, I'm gonna go up to him. So I was like, oh, Dr. Racaniello. And you were like, hello, who are you? And I was like, in my head, I'm like, you have no idea who I am. I was like, I'm a fan of TWIF. And he, yeah, we started talking. And I told him that I was a vet and that I was a PhD student. And for whatever reason, you thought I'd be good on TWIV. And here we are now. <laughs> I think we talked um, during the meeting and you said you had some interest in, in communication, right? Oh, yeah. So also. I said, yes. well, maybe we could do something together. And then uh, after we left, I said, well, oh, at the end of the meeting, I said, well, I'll be in touch. And then I said, why don't you come on for an episode? And um, uh, <laughs> everybody liked you so i said why don't you join us so you come on once a month i think because you have other things to do right yeah with the lab it's a little hard uh to do yeah. more than once a month but sometimes i get on like every three weeks depends yeah. um but yeah no it's mm -hmm. great and i think that that yeah that it's great i love twiv i love everyone on twiv sometimes some of the topics go slightly over my head but i try to ask questions that I think other people are also thinking, <laughs> especially when it's like structural virology. When it's structural virology, some of the papers, whew, <laughs> they're a little yeah, bit like, because tough, I'm not tough, used yeah. to reading those papers, they're difficult. So it's okay, folks. It's difficult even for me as a PhD student. <laughs> it's, it's not just, it's difficult for everyone. Um, okay, so let's go back to the questions here. Oh, so here, Chris uh, is a former, first and former McGill University Health and Safety Officer. Wow. Welcome, Hey, Chris. Chris. Welcome. <laughs> you still in Montreal? <laughs> uh, Chickenpox shingles, same virus, different vaccine. Well, the, the, shing, the uh, chickenpox vaccine was developed first for kids. And it's not a very good vaccine. It's an attenuated vaccine. And uh, then the shingles vaccine was developed later for adults. It's a, it's basically a glycoprotein. It's a purified protein, an adjuvanted, and it's really good. And so now they are considering actually replacing the chickenpox with the shingles vaccine, giving everyone the same vaccine. Because the shingles, which is called Shingrix, it's so good. I got mine um, uh, last year, at the end of last year, the two shots, yeah. Did you have any sort of like symptomology or no, anything? I had nothing. I, I, many people say that Shingrix knocks them out. I didn't have anything with Shingrix. <laughs> Angela, I got three vaccines a couple of weeks ago. I got COVID, flu, and RSV all at the same time. <laughs> nice. In one arm and two in the other. <laughs> nothing. I had no fever. I had a little sore arm, right? <laughs> Did so you Chris at least says, have like yeah, swollen lymph nodes? Probably. No, I, I actually lymph nodes. didn't. No, no, I, I don't have an immune system, I guess. <laughs> so Chris Lipowski says he lives in Sutton, which is 70 North. I don't know mm -hmm. what Sutton is. Sutton is a place uh, in, isn't Sutton in BC? Oh my gosh, if I get this wrong, people are going to, all the Canadians will kill me. Is it? <laughs> no, wait. Oh no, sorry, there's a Sutton in Quebec as well. Sorry, sorry, yes, in Quebec. Sutton, there's also skiing there. Yes, my sister Oliviana, another sister, has gone skiing there. There's one in BC, I believe, too, though. 
like British Columbia, West Coast Canada. So Hogger 51 says, RFK Jr. said about the NIH, if elected, thank you for your public service. We're going to give infectious disease a break for about eight years. We will be <laughs> standing behind some third world country. This is just so stupid. I'm sorry, right? To say you're going to give... It is, it, <laughs> Because the viruses and bacteria are waiting, right? You can just give it a break. Like, yeah, they're just going to chill. <laughs> Sorry. Moronic. Really uneducated and moronic, RFK Jr. But he's just saying that to get attention. And there's some people who will vote for him just for that. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if you answered this, but John says, what ushered you toward your career? A class, textbook, novel, teacher, movie? Was there something distinct that you recall? Uh... I think, well, towards veterinary medicine, like towards being a vet, I just, it sounds kind of cliche, but like I always loved animals and I always wanted to understand like how they worked, even humans. Like I almost went into human medicine. I was thinking about it between like a lot of people I feel like have this when they love animals, but then they also find just like the human body really interesting. But I think in the end I chose vet medicine because it was just more, I found like there was more diversity. Like I was more intrigued by like, studying lots of different animals as opposed to just like one. Uh, mm. I like the comparative aspect of that. And I also just literally loved animals so much. I wanted to help them and, you know, hate see them suffer uh, to be able to help them as much as I can. And now I try to do that via research, but <laughs> also helping them in the end. So Nicole is from Italy, 9C and cloudy there. Okay, Hat. Uh, by the way, Hat, I don't know if you were here two weeks ago, but I, I had to thank you for your, We got a contribution from Hat at the Incubator, so thank you very much for your support. We really, really appreciate it. Comment, not a question. Twiv 1057, Klaus Freud was absolutely amazing. I was totally blown away with the potential for these discoveries. Yeah, it was just great. The CMV stuff, right? Yeah, it was. that was a really cool episode. Oh, that T-cells persist. Mm. It's very, very cool. Uh, hmm. You weren't on that. That was, was no. it you and Rich? No, it was Dixon and Rich, right? Or Alan and Rich? I don't remember. I think it was Alan. I think. Okay, let's see. Scrolling down I'm here. Scro okay, I'm scrolling. Let's see. Uh... Hello, Doreen. What if Sweden, <laughs> Vincent? I don't know. Sweet Sweet. What does that I mean? Know. I don't know. I must have said Accidental something. fire. What is that? Mean? Well, that's his, his name. I don't know wh what I said, but uh, okay. Mm. Sweden. Were we talking about, maybe he meant Sutton. Maybe he thought Sutton, Sweden was in Sutton or maybe. vice versa. Sutton was in Sweden. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the, the next question I think is from Steph about the pandas. Oh yeah, well, uh, where is that? Let me find it so I can highlight it and bring it up here. Here we go, Steph. Yeah, I just read all the pandas are being sent back to China. How are they going to fare that huge relocation? Will their immune systems be compromised? I mean, I think she's referring to, like I Googled this quickly because I saw it before and it was from the zoo, right? Like from the San Francisco Zoo, I think it is, that they're sending them back, but they're very unclear as to where the pandas are going. Are they just going out into the wild? Or are they going to a center in China? Like, I'm not sure what that means, um, mm -hmm. that they're going back to China. But, well, obviously they would be better in their own habitat. Maybe there's another, I would guess that there would be another project in China where they would have a center that then they would slowly reintroduce them, but they would probably start reintroducing them, like their offspring, back into the wild. They wouldn't just take like a 10-year-old panda that's been in captivity and put them into the wild because that would be cruel. Because especially that animal would have never, like, it's only ever known the zoo, right? It's only ever known its enclosure. So um, that's normally never done, taking, like, adult animals. If they're smaller, if they're younger animals, juvenile animals, that is done sometimes. But not not an animal that's, like, in, you know, adult. Uh, sure. Immune systems will be compromised. I mean, just as much as any other animal, right? Like, not because they're going to China. I would think it's just an animal, once again, that's in a zoo that's maybe not exposed to as many pathogens as an animal that lives in the forest, right? An animal that lives in the forest is going to be in contact with other animals that have lots of viruses, lots of bacteria, fungus, the dirt, potentially humans. <laughs> um, 
as a, like as opposed to animals in a zoo will mostly just be in contact with their zookeeper. And sometimes that's a that's not a close contact. It depends on the species. The pandas might be closer, um, but there are some species that don't necessarily even touch, right? Like polar bears, they wouldn't get that close. Um, so I would think that if they were to take these pandas full grown, put them into the wild in China, yes, they would be potentially compromised. Oh, possibly, I would, but I highly doubt that's what's happening. Um, Cause right, like that's like anything. That's like if you live in a bubble and then you go out into, you know, New York City, you're, you haven't been exposed to like so many different pathogens, and maybe your immune system could be a little bit in overdrive. Um, but yeah, that would be. Mm. That's my answer. <laughs> okay, Lori wants to know: When you started vet school, did you know you were going to go into research rather than working at a clinic? Um, no. So. Well, I always liked the idea of research, but once again, I didn't really understand what it was in a in a biological context. I don't know how to, so I was very naive. So because my dad was a mathematician, I only ever saw him sitting at a table all day with like an equation for like <laughs> weeks and months and years with like differential equations. And he would just sit there sometimes like this for like days trying to figure something out. And I was like, I never want to do that. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Papa, I'm, I'm, if he's listening, I, I know it's amazing work and very necess like it's necessary. And you, there's a lot of applications to that math, especially in physics and in other places, right? Like in computational science and in bioinformatics and in modeling, and there's lots of uses for it. But um, I do not really enjoy math. For whatever reason, my brain does not really like math. And... Uh, yeah, I kind of figured out when I was in third year vet school, so it was a five-year program, uh, that mm -hmm. I wanted to go into research more because we started doing more labs and we started having to like, you know, lab reports and all this stuff and like doing uh, like our mini research. So we'd go out to farms, we would get samples. It was actually in parasitology that I got like more interested in this. So we would get like fecal samples and like placental samples or like nasal swabs and then we'd take them back to the to the parasitology lab and then we'd culture them and we'd like look at the different like you know spore assist whatever we would look at different sorts of like eggs in the feces and then we would you know stain them and like do different things and and i thought it was really cool just like being in the lab um yeah i got more interested than i think it then so parasites parasites and immunology learning immunology as well in third year second and third year got me interested and then i started like reaching out to do internships within my, um, within my faculty. Um, and yeah. So you're never going to take care of animals, right? I mean, I don't want to recently, I kind of like convinced myself for the first two years of my PhD that I was like, ah, I don't want to work in the clinic. I don't like that, whatever. Mm -hmm. But within the last year, I kind of miss it. Like I kind of miss just like being with the animals. And I really enjoy farm animals. It's just so mm. funny because like I, sometimes I sit in my lab and I'm like on the flow cytometer for like 12 hours and I'm sitting here and I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> and I'm like, I could be petting a cat or like with a horse in a field and I'm sitting here on a flow cytometer looking at T cells fly by. Like it's, but then I stop and I think, no, this means more. Like I think about the research and like the implications of my research and it's Im obviously important, but I mean, it also is really like fun and for me, like being yeah, with animals sure. and, you know, treating them and being on farms. I really enjoyed being like with farm animals. Um, it just kind of sucks because like most of them are animals of like production animals, like they're, you know, used for either mm. like their milk or their meat or whatever. So it's not the same like um, emotional bond. You can't really have an emotional bond with them, but there, yeah. <laughs> Years ago, I visited uh, Virginia Tech. The They have a joint uh, veterinary school with Maryland, Virginia, Maryland. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, so they took me on a little tour. <laughs> they had an MRI, right, for animals. It's huge. Mm -hmm. Must be for horses. They had Probably, a yeah. tiny kitten lying there. It was, it was <laughs> you know, anesthetized. 
being MRI. And then on the other side of the glass, there were like seven people monitoring this. All this for this tiny kitten. Right? <laughs> it was so funny. So the cute. amount of, of cost and just for this little kitten. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, I bet you the MRI was for horses because horses are the one animal that people will spend like lots of money on, especially racing mm -hmm. horses and things like that. Like they're worth, some of those horses are worth like a million dollars, like some yeah, of them sure, from, sure. from the Middle East. Yeah. So the MRIs, especially like with their, they get a lot of tendonitis, laminitis, like problems with their legs and, um, and yeah, there's definitely mm. lots of MRIs done on horses. A cow, probably not, unless it's some really rich man or rich woman's cow. <laughs> uh, Noir says, Dr. M, I caught mycoplasma pneumonia from cats at the rescue where I work. My immune system is compromised. What other cat diseases should I be concerned about catching? Cat diseases. Well, there's like the typical, um, what is it? <laughs> cat scratch disease, which is Bartonella, I think. Uh, Bartonellosis that you can catch just from like cats literally scratching you. Also, um, uh, Staph aureus. Cats can also have Staph aureus if they bite you. Some of them have Staph aureus, Staphylococcus aureus in their mouth. Um, so you have to be careful with that. So you don't want any sort of open wound and cat saliva around you for sure. Um, I mean, they can have different parasites too, right? Like scabies, but your cat is probably, she said her cat. Um, uh, the rescue where she oh, works. at the rescue, then yeah, be careful with, I'm sure you guys watch for scabies, um, which is like an ectoparasite on the skin, which causes mange in cats and dogs. Uh, cause if you get that on your skin, people can get scabies. Like it's a thing in vet school. We had people that got scabies. Uh, so it is zoonotic. You can get it. Um, and ringworm you can also get, which is, um, it's not actually a worm, so it sounds like it's a worm, but it's actually a fungus, dermatophytosis. And I think it's, what's the species? Gypsium mentagraphites, I think is like the, one of the main species that is zoonotic that people can get. And the lesions are like circular. That's why they call it ringworm, because it's like a circular lesion. And then the edges have like, like to kind of like scabby or like, um, like dry skin. So... So yeah, viruses, not so much, mostly like bacterial and fungal pathogens. Viruses, I can't think of any that are zoonotic um, that like could transmit to a person, but bacteria, oh yeah. And fungi also. Uh, just a little side note here, Mr. Doreen. Now, uh, <laughs> I called Mr. Doreen that two weeks ago because I forgot his name and now he's got a handle <laughs> called Mr. Doreen, Doreen's husband who came to ASTMH in Chicago. We took a picture with him and Daniel and myself and his his wife Doreen wasn't there, so he held up a picture of her, which you can see here, oh, which I showed two weeks ago, and I called him uh, to Mr. Doreen. Now he's taken it uh, to heart. Yeah, there you go. Cute. Um, uh, Carol says our family's favorite vacation was Lake Louise, Canada. My fourteen year old cat was diagnosed with FIV. Any suggestions or thoughts? Uh, I mean. Yeah, a lot of cats have FIV. Any suggestions or cuts to not get other animals if you can, to not get another cat? Um, I mean, unless you have a cat already, and if you've already put them together, um, I believe it's transmittable. Am I misremembering FIV? Let me double check. No, I think it is. Yes, you can transmit it. I think it's via... Um, what is it through like bites? It would have to be if they bite each other. So if you have another cat, um, be aware that it will probably also get FIV. Uh, if it's young, normally cats can live a fairly healthy life, um, for a bit. And then once they get elderly is when it, it becomes more of a problem. Did she say how old it was? 14, 14 years old. Cat. Yeah. Um, there's not, there's not really anything isn't you can do. Isn't remdesivir effective against FIV? Have you heard remdesivir, that? Remdesivir, but in a 14 year old, I don't actually know if remdesivir is effective. Let's see. I'm pretty uh, sure that uh, Noir has Any talked cats? about treating her cats with remdesivir. Really? Uh, yeah. Let's see. Mm. But I think it's off label. It is. So yes. It yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, okay, I was gonna say, but it's not, it wouldn't be, um, yeah, 22% survival on remdesivir with cats. Okay, um, I don't know if your vet would suggest remdesivir because it's off-label, some vets don't like prescribing, mm -hmm. but you could ask. Um, also, it, yeah, depending on how long the cat has had the FIV, this could be um, already quite advanced. Like if the cat has had it for like many years, then there could already be some organ damage, some systemic damage done that even with remdesivir might not be, you know, uh, they wouldn't regain the function of that, those organs necessarily. So I would say just keep the cat happy as you can, as good as you can, like as, you know, um, as happy as possible and make sure that he continues to eat and drink water. And then if you see any sort of like sudden changes with like drinking or eating, then definitely go to the vet. Uh, or if you see that there, he's like extremely lethargic or in pain or starts like hiding all the time, things like that can be signs of, of your animal being more sick. So the thing is that cats will hide they'll like just like dogs but cats even more so they can be extremely ill and you'll never know it until the cat is literally almost gonna die mm -hmm. like they will they compensate so much it's crazy so that's why it's like but owners know these things like owners can see sometimes like small differences in their cats so just try to be aware especially like bowel movements as long as they're still having bowel movements um and urinating because that's important um so yeah i'm sorry to hear that about your cat but um, hopefully he's doing okay. I don't know if it's a he or she, but. Uh, might Angela tell us a little bit about eradication of rinderpest or other animal pathogens, a candidate for elimination? Rinderpest. Okay. So rinderpest. Wow. I haven't thought about rinderpest in so long in, in ruminant species. <laughs> mm -hmm. What year was this eradicated? This was in, uh, like the late 1800s. Wasn't no, it? No, no. Pretty recently. Rinderpest no, was but eradicated. I mean, but mainly, but mostly, 2011. But I mean, the main, like the the, <laughs> I should say, spike in Rinderpest was late 1800s, and okay. then it was kind of like low level circulating. It wasn't really. Um, let me see, Rinderpest. Yeah, there was a small spike in the 80s. I mean, other things for eradication. There's also like African swine fe fever, but it's so hard to try to eradicate, um, <laughs> which is very, very, I know it seems like not that big of a deal, but it's actually a huge problem in Europe and in Africa and in China, African swine fever, um, um, which affects obviously pigs and it can affect other animals as well. I think it has multiple hosts. Um, I mean, what other things would we want to try to eradicate? Eradication of a disease of a of a pathogen is really hard. Vincent spoke about this recently on talking about polio. What were the three things that we need for eradication? We need um, we need uh, only humans are the only host, or so one animal exactly. is the host. One and host, lifelong immunity, mm -hmm. and in apparent infections do not contribute to spread. Which is very difficult in animals, especially animals sure. that are yeah. in like high density um, yeah. environments. So like another candidate for eradication, <laughs> we would love to say influenza, but that's never going to happen. <laughs> no, <Nope. laughs> definitely so not. So Noir says FIP is treatable with remdesivir, not FIV. Yeah. Okay. That's what FIP, yeah, yeah, feline. So the peritonitis, infectious peritonitis, which is a coronavirus actually. Right. So that would make more sense because remdesivir it yeah. has been shown to be effective against other coronaviruses. I had never heard about it in FIV, but. Uh, what are COVID symptoms in dogs? What's the likelihood of dog to human transmission and vice versa? Uh, COVID, actually most dogs that have had, that were SARS-CoV-2 positive, didn't really have symptoms. As far as I can remember the, the papers that I've read, dogs didn't really have symptoms because also once again, animals will mask their symptoms at all cost. Like they're mm. not, an animal can be extremely ill, but it will not show externally that it is ill because obviously evolutionarily that would show them as weak. And if they're prey, then they could be preyed on by a predator. So this is something that's, um, 
like respiratory symptoms have to, you have to have a really, 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 really severe infection for a dog or a cat to show respiratory um, symptomology. Dogs, like a dog sneezing or coughing, it's just not really a thing. Um, so the SARS-CoV-2 positive animals, as far as I can remember from the publications that are, that are out there, they were asymptomatic. They just swabbed them to, because a lot of people were like sequencing their animals. Um, dog to human mm. transmission. There's been none as far as I, as far as I know, mink to human. Yes. Mm. I think we said deer to human as well. Did we say there was a spillback from deer, right? Yeah. There's some about. suspicion in mm -hmm. Canada, right? Um, yeah. It, in Ottawa uh, or in Ontario. Yeah. 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 But Rima dog wants to know to human. what's, what's your favorite pet? <laughs> well, my dog Odin is obviously my favorite pet. Odin, but, the god see, of my, what? The god of what? I I knew this the last time you saw him. Um, what is he? Oh, the god of war? Isn't that the god of war? He is here on my iPad. I have to show you guys. God of war. This is death. Odin. Oh, cool. <laughs> oh no! He went, he went away. Black, can see us. There, there he is. Cute. He is. That's him <laughs> on the beach in the Canary Islands. <laughs> So yeah, the God of War, he's only like 19 pounds, but he's fiery. So he's my favorite pet. But as for animals, favorite animal, which maybe she was referring to, uh, I love whales. Whales are my thing. Whales yeah. are cool. Favorite yeah. animal, my favorite animal is the octopus. Oh yeah, that's why you don't eat them because they're so smart. Yeah, they're t incredibly <laughs> smart. It's a terrible to eat them. Did you ever see that wonderful cartoon about two octopi who were being chased in greece no you look at, i thought you were going to say the the netflix documentary the no, my pet it's, a, or it's a short called. it's a short animated um film it's like five minutes of uh there's a, there are two octopi in a, in a tank in a restaurant and the chef takes one out and is about to chop it up and the other one rescues it and then there's a mad chase through the city and they get away at the end it's really cute it's very cute. Yeah. Octopodi, I think it's called. Let me see. Octopodi. O C T O P O D I. Yes. O K T A P O D I. It was a Oscar animated short film. It's really good. Okay. It's really good. Check it out. Octopodi. Uh, I'll okay. Check it out. Uh, Noir writes Dr. Mingarelli, was so cool to see you at TWIV 1000. <laughs> well, thank so, you. So, so Noir was there. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I met a whole bunch of people afterwards. I'm sorry if I don't remember who you, how, what you look like, but I'm sure you were very, very friendly. <laughs> Lori wants to know, can you do intravital microscopy on the brain in mice? Can the animal recover after doing intravital? On the brain. Okay, so intravital on the brain. I know I don't, so I don't do intravital on the brain. I know that there's um, the lab next to my, well, on the floor above us, they do... They have like a glioblastoma model in the brain, but they don't do intravital. Because the thing with intravital is that when you do intravital, you're literally imaging the tissue as the cells are alive. So like, for example, what you can do is if you want to look at like peritoneal macrophages, you can like do a laparotomy and then open up one of the, basically open up the, the side of the animal. So like the abdominal sac, let's call it. And on the peritoneum, you can then image the peritoneum like live. But you, so you have to have the actual organ. So in the brain, I don't see how that would be possible because there's the cranium is in between. Like you would have to cut a hole. Maybe people do this. I don't do neuro. I don't know enough about like neuroimaging, but it would definitely be terminal. Like maybe you could do, you could keep the animal alive with, um, cause technically you would be able to, I mean, mm. I don't know about the imaging though, like through the slice. Cause you would have to be in the brain the depth of the stack. Yeah, I don't know. You could do, you could cut out the brain and then slice it and then the cells maybe would still be alive, but I don't think you could do mouse alive imaging in the brain. But who knows? Science is really cool. Maybe people do that. <laughs> maybe they found a way. John writes, Angela, a TWIV guest from the San Diego Zoo said it was helpful to classify animals by their stomachs. Does that resonate with you? <laughs> Actually, yes. That's funny because <laughs> a lot of, well, not only by their stomachs, but yeah, you think about like ruminants, for example, have four stomachs. 
So they have like the rumen, which is called, they're called ruminants because they ruminate also, um, because basically they swallow their food and then it comes back up and then they swallow it again. And there's different phases of digestion. So there's the rumen, the um, reticulum, the omasin and the abomasum. And the abomasum is what we consider like a glandular stomach, like mm -hmm. what we have, that's the abomasum. Um, but then if you think about like uh, different animals, like birds, they have like two portions to their stomachs. Uh, they have like a glandular and a muscular stomach. So the proventriculus, um, and then you think about camels, they're like kind of ruminants. I think they have three compartments if I'm not mistaken. So yes, lots of different animals, depending on their digestion, <laughs> they have like different stomachs. Um, and then also their intestines are different. Like normally you have carnivores will have shorter, shorter, small intestines so shorter digestive tracts in general. Um, and then omnivores and herbivores, herbivores, especially will have very long digestive tracts to digest all of these, um, structural carbohydrates, like in fiber and et cetera, like, um, all the plants that they eat basically. And then like horses have this huge cecum. So you know how humans have like a little appendix, which is just like, mm. we're like, Oh, what is this? Well, it's basically like a vestigial cecum, um, which is used for, which is, this is the, the theory um that in horses is huge so horses get colic most of the time because this enormous cecum that like i can't even show you guys how big it is it's like probably the size of like my torso <laughs> it's enormous um <laughs> it's where a lot of the a lot of the fibers are digested in a horse because horses are actually one of two monogastric herbivores so john this is how we start we think about things so we think of there's a uh, polygastric herbivore, which would be like a cow, because then they would have four stomachs, or a goat, or a sheep, um, or a deer. Deers are ruminants, which is cool. So a lot of people think of them as horses. But then you have a horse. Horse and rabbit are the two species, domestic species that we know about that are uh, monogastric herbivores. So they both have very developed cecums, which is where they do the digestion of um, the plants, structural carbohydrates from, from, um, basically from plants. So, um, but they also have a lot of problems with this because the cecum can get very large and it fills with a lot of gas, right? Because like the digestion of these plants produces a lot of gas. Um, and if a horse doesn't move, so if a horse is like stagnant, like sitting in one place for too long, this cecum, or if it runs too fast after eating, like if you never, you never feed a horse and then run with it, just like a dog. A lot of you probably have heard about like giant breed dogs. Um, you never feed them and then go for a run because their stomach can twist on itself and then cause, uh, <laughs> literally their stomach can explode. So uh, because their thoracic cavity is really large and their abdominal cavity is really large and like their stomach has a lot of space to like move around so it can twist on itself. Um, same thing with a horse in its, so it's, it's, it's in its abdominal cavity has a lot of space and the, the cecum can actually twist on itself and then it can explode. So that's why when wow. horses are in like severe colic, um, the vet will tell you to literally just walk the horse. So walking a lot of the time the the peristalsis starts moving everything. And then sometimes it can ease its way and actually untwist. That's just one form of colic. There's many other forms, but so yes, this whole stomach thing is definitely a thing in veterinary medicine, like defining animals by how they digest food and how many stomachs they have. So Angela, I've seen veterinarians put a glove on their arm and stick their arm all the way into the butt of a, of a cow. What are they trying to do? Oh yeah. So <laughs> not only cows, you can do that to horses too, but horses uh -huh. are way more mean about it. Uh, yeah. So they normally probably we're kick doing you, pregnant. right? <laughs> yes. I have been kicked by horse and cow. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so that's why you stand to the side. You never stand like directly behind them. Uh, with a cow, you can, but horses actually have, um, so they can't kick sideways because they have this specific ligament on the head of their femur that doesn't allow them to kick sideways. So huh. you're always safe if you're next to a horse, mm -hmm. never behind a horse. Um, so what you're doing when you do, um, when you see all these vets like going into the rectum and you have to evacuate the rectum first. So you basically have to like take out all the poo and you're mm -hmm. doing a pregnancy check. So yeah. normally it's in dairy cows cause you can reach the uterus. You never want to put your arm 
into the cervical into the cervix right because you can introduce bacteria and obviously the the uterus is closed it only opens upon birth like it only dilates um during birthing so it's really cool though in a cow there's so much space once again it's like a huge cavity and you can actually feel from the rectum because it's very the rectum is like it's huge it's like you can imagine how large it is like when my arm is in there i feel like it's at least 30 centimeters high and 30 centimeters wide like it's like 12 inches by 12 inches at least um and you can feel the horns of the uterus you can actually feel the uterus itself you can feel the ovaries and the fallopian tubes everything so when you have um a, a, let's say you're in a you know a dairy farm and you inseminate so most of it is artificial insemination with like these long straws because it's too hard on the cows to actually have like the bulls mounting them and mm -hmm. it's hard on the bull as well so it's mostly artificial insemination so you'll come back like a month or two later because gestation of a cow is 10 months so you'll come back and then you'll um you have to be very careful in the beginning though because you're literally pressing on the ovary, right? You're trying to look for a tiny little sac, which would be the the growing fetus. Mm. So you can actually cause an like abortion. So it can abort or miscarry. Uh, well, we call abortion miscarry. You would cause the fetus to detach and then like a, the cow to miscarry. So you have to be really careful in the beginning. Uh, and then we can also take, I don't know if anyone's seen you, take the ultrasound. So they have like a little wand. And then once the, you can pull the wand in, and you you get really good at it in the beginning it's really hard <laughs> but then you localize the the um the uterine horn first and then you take the wand this is all in with like one hand in right we don't have two hands we have one hand um you localize the uterine horn and then you can use the ultrasound and actually see like on your screen outside of the cow the mm. little fetus it's super yeah it's super wow. cool actually wow. uh, and it's all through the rectum everything is through the rectum and you can do the same thing in a horse but horses um they're a little bit more difficult to work with so sometimes you put like a bale of hay if you can between you and the horse in case you get kicked you have like <laughs> i'm not joking this has happened to me i got kicked i had two bales of hay and i was like doing an ultrasound and i got kicked and i flew back like like two and a half meters it was crazy i like the, the horse kicked the hay so it didn't kick me that's why the hay was there and we i flew back and the person next to me flew back it was hilarious like we didn't get hurt but it was yeah poor horse so even with a horse you have to stand on the side or but a cow also you stand on the side can cows kick no, sideways think, no. um cows can kick side they normally don't though they can but they normally don't uh with a cow what you do is as you're doing it you kind of like learn this so as you're doing the rectal exam uh you watch which weight the cow has its like where it's its weight is. So right. this is what I always did. And my, my cousin, he's a dairy vet and he taught me this. So if the cow is leaning on like its left leg, so then it means that its right leg is free to kick, then you're gonna stand on the left side. <laughs> and then if mm. it switches its weight, you're gonna slightly turn. So sometimes they do kick, but you try to like either stay between both legs, like right in the pelvis, so you stand sideways. Mm. So if it kicks, it's kind of like just passing you. I don't know if you know what I mean. Like you have to just be vigilant with cows. Like you can get kicked, but sometimes you can tell like how will normally like raise its leg and you'll see it's, it's hoof is like off the ground. And then you're like, okay. And you kind of like back up. A horse will just gosh. like send it. A horse will just go without telling you. <laughs> My gosh. Yeah. Well, that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long rant about cows and horses and stomachs, but yeah. All right. So Hannah's is going to be at ASMQ. Come by 530 on Saturday is TWIM. Hannah, if you come by, even if you come after to say hello, I'll give you a microbe TV sticker. Okay. I got a bunch of them I'll bring with me. So come by, Hannah. Good to see you. All right. Here we go. Angela, H5N1 wasn't known to be so neurotropic in animals. Is there an evolutionary pressure for a respiratory virus to become neurotropic? <laughs> I feel like this is a better question for Vincent than for me. I mean, I don't know if there's any evidence of that like evolutionary pressure for a, um yeah <sighs> i don't think there is any why i 
Because the the brain is the dead end, right? When viruses get yeah, in, yeah, there's, there's nothing to do in the brain. Exactly, it's, I, there's nothing to do there. So it's a dead. There's no selective force to go to a dead end. That's the way I look. Yeah, at there's it. no transmission. There's yep. no like yep. in the lungs. It's good. You can transmit in the gut. It's good. You can transmit in the urine. It's good. You can transmit, but the brain exactly. is just like it's just gonna hang out there and do nothing. Like I think it's, it's, it's probably, almost like when you're talking about polio. It's accidental, right? Yeah, same thing. Same idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, polio transmits beautifully from the intestines, right? And so mm -hmm. there's there's this detour, an accidental detour gets in the CNS, that's a dead end. I think these H5N1s that are neurotropic, it's just an accident of some other change in the virus that does that. And it's the same as with polio, most likely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. M, have you seen the FIP cats who have been saved with remdesivir? Talk about uh, that me before. personally? No. Um, I know that it's, that it's used, that remdesivir is used with FIP, but I haven't worked with, like, I didn't work a long time in the clinical field. So myself, no, I have not seen that. I do know that it's, been, that it, it's used, um, but I haven't actually seen any cats right. myself, but I think it's wonderful that, that we can use that with another coronavirus in animals and that it's, it has good, they have good prognosis. Doreen says, uh, please relay my apology to Dr. Griffin on behalf of Chicago that he got COVID here. <laughs> Glad he's fine because he had a plan. Yeah. So did Dixon. He also got COVID in uh, Chicago, but I didn't. Is Dixon okay? He's like, yeah, Dixon's, Dixon's you know, he's 80 something. He yeah, has to they, be careful. They got, well, they got Paxlovid. They're fine. Yep. Oh, yeah. Okay, Angry Penguin says, my wife got her first ever RSV shot last week. No ill effects. I showed her a clip of you and Dr. Griffin talking about how RSV outcomes can be much more serious compared to influenza and COVID. Well, very good. I'm glad to hear that. Silvio Pina, thank you uh, very much for your support of science communication. I missed your recent notes on the COVID vax booster you decided to get. Which one? Uh, I've only had a total of three so far. They're offering the bivalent. No, you shouldn't get the bivalent. No, what you want if you're gonna get a booster, you just get the new one, which is a monovalent XBB yeah. something. No, no hmm. bivalent. This is bad because it just gives you, um, yeah, recall right. Amnesia. Get the original antigenic sin basically because you're making preferential responses to that original. Uh, uh, isolated strain so or variant, let's say, yeah. isolated. Yeah, I I didn't have a choice which one I got. I think they gave me the Pfizer. Okay, but um, yeah, I haven't actually got it either. But I'm also, I mean, you have, I haven't. But I'm also, I think, you know, young, healthy. I've already had three, four. I don't even know how many shots. I think I had three. Um, I think that if you're immunocompromised or, you know, have comorbidities that maybe it would be a good idea, like Daniel says, but, um, I mean, if they're asking about that specifically, I haven't, I'm not against it either. If I'm, I mean, if I had somebody elderly in my life that I thought that I could potentially, or somebody that's immunocompromised that I was mm -hmm. going to be interacting with, I would probably get it. But like my grandparents have passed away and I don't really interact with the, um, the elderly much or immunocompromised people or people that are unvaccinated because I feel like most people are now. So Costello wants to know, do all scientists have a science family? <laughs> no. I, I did Dakota not. Rogers in my lab. So sorry, he's out of my lab now. He, we were talking about this recently, actually. He's comes from, he's the first person um, in his family to ever even go to university, like to finish high school and go to university. And he's a wonderful scientist, but so I know that just because we're talking about it now, I know your parents also, Vincent were, uh, physicians. Your father was a physician, right? My father was and, a physician. My mother was an English teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So not all scientists come from science families. Some do, some don't. I don't think mm -hmm. there's a rule. Uh, Hans, Twiv pearls, Paul Offit's tyranny of small numbers, Amy's infectious diseases are genetic diseases, and Klaus Fruz, just because something's immunogenic doesn't mean it's protective. Those are all good gems, yes, pearls. <laughs> that was a wonderful episode. I think that was one of the best episodes in a while. He was really, really good. And just, yep, yeah. He was great. He was really good. 
Dang, that's cool, Bryce. It seems like the majority of phages are DNA viruses. While RNA viruses cause lots of diseases in animals, is there something these hosts that make DNA versus RNA better genomes? Okay, so this is an interesting question. So we used to think there was some reason why uh, RNA viruses did not uh, uh, were not abundant in the bacteriosphere, the prokaryotes, but it turns out we just hadn't found them. There have been a whole slew of new RNA viruses of bacteria that have been discovered, and so it's not a thing anymore. Yeah. Hmm. So Eugene Coonan published a paper not too long ago showing all these brand new RNA viruses of bacteria. So it's just a matter of we not having found them as usual, right? You just have to look and you'll find anything. The more well, you there know. Was, there was yeah. someone had written here something in Spanish. I forgot to read. Let's see. <clears throat> I'm going to oh, scroll really? back here. No, no. <clears throat> Hola. Hace pelete. What does that mean? Oh, hace pelete aquí en Montreal. Means it's really cold here in Montreal. Wait. Pelete is a word that we use in the Canary Islands. I don't think you use that. I wonder. Bioinformatics. Are you Canarian? Because pelete is like, it means like very cold. Um, so they're just saying that's it's funny. very cold here in Montreal, but that's a word. It's a slang that we use in the Canary Islands. So I wonder if this person is from there by informatics. <laughs> hmm. uh, Craig wants you to explain two photon microscopy. <clears throat> Can you do uh, that? I unfortunately can't do that because I don't actually use this microscope. The other people in my lab do. <laughs> I think Vincent can explain it better than I can. <laughs> well, the idea is well, we that- can just Google it. You know, you have two two beams of light that converge, and where they converge, they excite a fluorophore. And that has a greater resolution than having one beam go in and hit a fluorophore because they have to cross at the, the point of excitation. So there's less scattering and so forth. That's that's hmm. my understanding. So clearer images, I guess we could say, more precise images. Yeah, so so Craig says, why not just one high energy photon? Yeah, that's the advantage that two is better than having uh, the one high energy photon. Mm -hmm. They pass through each other. So um, I I don't really have a better explanation. It, Craig says, I'm guessing that longer wavelengths penetrate better into the material, or is it less damaging? I'm not sure if that's really mm -hmm. it. <clears throat> But um, you can Google it. Yeah, <laughs> you get a better answer. I don't know. I don't know too much about the. <clears throat> now, what's this? Canary it... Islands, que hermosa. What does that mean? Que hermosa means like how beautiful. Ah, because okay. hermosa means beautiful, or hermoso is like handsome. <clears throat> so, hand hermosa. So why not three photons? It, Lori wants to know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't, we don't know these things, Lori. <laughs> Someone knows two photons. Two photons walk into a bar. It can happen, yeah. Oh, Pete uh, writes, uh, we were in Lanzarote the last month for a week. Very pleasant. We managed to get my partner's 95-year-old dad on the plane, too. Could be his last few chances to travel. I've never been. Oh, Should wow. I go? Lanzarote is so beautiful. Yeah, there's, it's a, well, the Canary Islands are very volcanic, and Lanzarote has a lot of, like, the Green Cave. It's, like, this very popular um tourist site there it's it's uh like this under underground there's lots of spelunking this cave with like little um what are they called what are those i always forget what they're called in english those like little spikes that are on the roofs of caves no, stalactites. That form over. stalactites yes and stalagmites. exactly that take like hundreds of thousands or thousands of years to form there's lots of them <laughs> in the green cave lanzarote is beautiful have, have you ever been to ibiza no, I have not. But I don't really want to go. It's not really my vibe. Like the yeah, partying. Party I would love now. to go to Formentera or some of the other islands in the in Baleares. So Ibiza mm. is like one of the islands. But I would love to go diving because, you know, I love the ocean and all this stuff. Um, I would love I to go diving go. in some of the others. I want to go to Ibiza and see EDM all night. <laughs> Okay, I'll go if you go, Vincent. We can go together. I'll go okay. with you. Okay. All right. Okay. Because yeah, you have to protect me. I'll protect you, yes. <clears throat> For those of you that don't know, I'm tall. I'm like 5'10", 178 <laughs> centimeters. And I'm short. <laughs> uh, Doreen says, are there any developments in tissue cloning that may allow fewer animal sacrifices for research? Mm, 
I mean, I don't know if tissue cloning would be a method of not sacrificing animals. I mean, I know it. So the thing is, it's very difficult because like having an actual animal, like a living organism is never going to be the same as having something in cell culture, right? Like it's, you can't, there are certain things that we can't learn from, because when she says tissue cloning, I'm assuming she means like some sort of cell culture, um, where we do cloning in cell culture to study mm -hmm. like a specific gene or phenomena or whatever. Um, but I think that's difficult because you don't have like the same complex system that you do in a body, right? Which in a mammalian species, a host, like in a mouse, like if you want to study an immune response and you're looking in cells, you might have like an innate immune response, like interferons and stuff like that, but you don't have like the complexity of the, not even just the immune response of the tissue itself, right? Yeah. Stromal cells, like the parenchymal cells, like everything, the blood, the interstitial fluid, all of the signals, like it's, it's very difficult. Um, like it's unfortunate that we have to use animals in, in research. And I think that we are using less. There's a lot of compared to before, maybe I'd like to hope we are because there are certain things that we can do with models now that maybe aren't necessary, or we can maybe limit our use of, of mice because we, we understand more that we can get more out of like one experiment. When I do an experiment with my mice. I think, okay, what is like everything that I can learn from this experiment? What are all of the tissues I can take? Instead of doing like four experiments and looking at, you know, one organ each time, I think through it the best I can to sacrifice the least amount of mice that I have to so I can um, limit that uh, animal sacrifice. Because especially me, I hate having to sack mice, so, sorry, sacrifice mice um, and euthanize them. They're, so I limit as much as I can. Uh, and I try to give them as much environmental enrichment as I can. Give them food, give them huts, you know, little cute things. Try to make them as comfy as possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, special food. Obviously, they receive food. I have like this cherry food that's like special that like they love. I'll give that to them if I have to oh, do anything. Oh, it's very nice. Yeah. It's awfully nice. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Polio. Polio Pete wants to know what would happen to a person's immune system if they took COVID mRNA vaccine every three months for the rest of their lives? I mean, it would just be a whole bunch of spike protein in your body for a long time. Like, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, would have we like, don't know. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, one I thing that Paul Offit says is that you might start making autoantibodies, right? Because you're going through so mm. much somatic hypermutation that you start to make antibodies to your to yourself. But I don't know that we know that would happen, right? Are there autoantibodies in um, HIV? I know very little about HIV. Are there any? Do we know? Not like in a chronic that. infection and a chronic, because this would be considered like just a chronic viral infection. If you're getting every three months, it would be, it could yeah. be maybe similar. They have been found in, um, in patients. Yeah. Okay. Rheumatoid factor, yeah. antiphospholipid, anti-smooth muscle, platelets, erythrocytes. Yeah. So they do arise. Mm. Interesting. Very interesting. I wonder if in like herpes as well, because herpes goes latent, right? So maybe that's not the same, yeah. but... Yeah. Yeah, we don't okay. know until it's done. <laughs> uh, Visto wants to know what animals are being infected with H5N1. H5N1 now or in general? Um, well, you know this new this new epidemiological shift where now it's 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 infecting all year round rather than having a seasonality. You know, lots of mm -hmm. birds. Well, I mean, birds also, definitely birds. Sea mammals are being infected, like in the South America That's true. sea lions. There's you know sea lions and I think some dolphins. I think also, well, birds, so we know like chickens and turkeys and like domestic birds for sure. Mm. Um, and then even pet birds can also be infected. Um, so if you have some sort of, you know, uh, um, like parrots, I guess. I don't even know if, <sighs> am I, I know that pet birds can, but I actually don't know the species. So I shouldn't say that. Um, but yeah, some marine mammals, I think it, the, the host, like the host for H5N1 is pretty broad. I'm, I don't want to say all yeah. mammalian species, yeah. but I don't think we know, right? Because influenza viruses are, are pretty good at infecting mammals. So, yeah. um, yeah. All right. So Questel, this is very funny. I almost missed the stream. I've been trying to fix a clogged tub. I can't stop thinking <laughs> about biofilm. That's perfect, right? <laughs> That's what clogs your tub, <laughs> biofilm. Well, some hair oh, too, yeah. I guess. Yeah. 
Get some Drano in there. Yes. <laughs> Questella likes your hair. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> she wants, and also Lori wants to know if you intravital on bats. I wish. No, I don't because we'd need to have like a BSL-3 or a BSL-4 for that. So the thing with working with bats is that because they're potential reservoirs for many, many viruses, doing anything with an actual bat is very difficult. So most of the work that we do is out in the field, we sample them and then this samples then get sent to other places and then we receive the data. Um, but there is uh, a, um, a captive colony at McMaster University in Canada, which is in Ontario, and they have the big brown bat and they can do more things like with their bats. Also, Tony Shount at um, in Fort Collins in Colorado, he has a um, a colony of bats. What are they? Mm. They're the um, are they Egyptian fruit? No, they're not Egyptian fruit bats. They're a different type of fruit bat that he has. Um, African fruit bat, maybe. So one and that uh, Ebola goes into, right? Is it the Helidon nil? What is it? No. Helidon nilvum? No. I thought it was Egyptian fruit bats. Aelodon, Aelodon helvum. That's the that's the Aelodon okay. helvum is the Ebola, the potential like suspected Ebola virus reservoir. Uh, Tony shouts. So yeah, unless you have an actual um, bat colony and even so because in bat colonies normally then you would test for certain pathogens you test for lysa viruses with rabies you test for um i don't know if now they probably test for sars cov2 i'm guessing um but there are certain pathogens ebola nipa etc that you would test for um and maybe for them they don't have mm. to do bsl3 in their colony but if you get any sort of bat like us even just to accept samples we have to bring everything into the BSL-3, which is like a high level lab where you need to wear a lot of PPE and you have to have like, everything takes so much longer in a BSL-3 because in the hood you need to, like in the biosafety hood, <laughs> you have yeah. to wait three minutes in activation time for everything with hydrogen peroxide. It is so tedious. I hate working in the BSL-3. <laughs> Uh, Noir says, Angela, you're wonderful. I enjoy listening to your contributions. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank Come you here. for your uh, contributions. This is what we like to stream. We can feel good here on the stream. Thank you, John, for your co contribution to science communication. Loving the fact that her father is a mathematician. As a former math major, I would wager Angela's statistics are on point. <laughs> Thank you, John. He's the one with the wonderful questions about the stomachs and the vets and the, yep. you know, he yeah, was asking he about the stomachs. Yep. Yeah. All right. Carol wants to know how long after the shingles vaccine are you protected from disease? <clears throat> you know, it's not a very old vaccine. I think it's just been licensed in the last 10 years. So we don't know actually how long it's going to mm. be. I think so far it's held up, but we'll see. Here's one for TV. you, Angela. You'll have to read this one. Oh, okay, Angela, me gustó mucho la historia de tu vida académica, muy variada e increíblemente interesante. Gracias. <laughs> so that means, and so I just had to read it, you know. Uh, Angela, I really liked your, the story about your academic life. Uh, very variada means like varied, so like very different and incredibly interesting. Thank you, Hans Collin. He was the one from Ecuador, I think. I believe Hans said he was from Ecuador mm -hmm. at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, Doreen says the Shingrix shingles doesn't care. Commercials are genius. Hilarious. Must, must watch. I haven't seen them. Me neither. Uh, have you? I haven't seen them. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't watch TV like commercials unless it's a commercial on YouTube between my consumption of YouTube content. <laughs> I do not watch TV. Uh, Chris says, uh, Sutton is 70 miles from Montreal. Exactly. Yeah. Sorry about that mistake, Chris. Risto says, does Shingrix eliminate latent infection? No, it does not. But when you reactivate the antibodies and T cells, you know, restrict uh, disease. That's how it works. Uh, let's see. Just finished The Secret Lives of Bats by Merlin Tuttle. Have you heard of that book? I actually haven't. I was just reading that. I have to write this down. I need a pen. I mean, I could use my laptop, but I like writing things. Any other bat <laughs> nonfiction recommendations? I don't know any bat nonfiction. I don't know any either, actually. Um, Looking at my shelf here, I don't have any bat books. No. 
bat nonfiction. No, I don't really read all the stuff that I read about bats is like, I mean, mostly publications on bats. Right. I'm going to do a bats. little, I'm going to do a little self-indulgence here. I'm going to show So this book is a biography of David Baltimore by Shane Crotty. Nice. So Shane is an immunologist. Okay. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And, um, there's a chapter in here. <laughs> this is very funny. Um, it's actually between two chapters. I have to find it. Um, let's see. It is really, it's called Interlude. <laughs> You're going to love this, folks. You know, uh, Pol uh, Baltimore worked on polio virus, and I did a postdoc uh, in David's lab, as you may recall. Uh, and um, where is this Interlude thing here? Hang on. Be, be patient because this is <laughs> worth it. This is worth it. Uh, I just saw this on my shelf. Oh, here it is. Here it is. So uh, there's an end of a chapter here, and then you turn the page, and it says polio virus and interlude. I don't think you can see it. It's not in focus. No, you can't really see but it. But he talks we about believe how, you, though. how I, I cloned the genome and sequenced it, and then he's got the next 10 pages. He has the genome sequence uh, of polio virus there. Okay. So it's the sequence oh, wow. he that... He has 10 pages of... <laughs> Yeah, he's got ten. He's all the genome sequence, all the way to the uh, the three prime end, the poly A tail. That's just cool. It's called interlude. It's just a little chapter there, and he says in the beginning. I was so surprised when he wrote that. Um, once the Cambridge ban on recombinant DNA was lifted, one of the first pieces of DNA that the Baltimore laboratory cloned was poliovirus genome. This was done by Vincent Rack and Yellow, a postdoctoral fellow in the lab. Isn't that cool? Stock. I remember seeing a picture. Wait, I took a picture. I have to show everyone of Vincent's uh, presentation at McGill the other day about enteroviruses and poliovirus. And there was a picture of him as a postdoc. Oh, where is it? I took a picture. I took a picture of a picture. Here it is. This is 1977. Let's see. Yeah, There's 1970. Vin yeah, that's, that's a graduate oh, no. student. There's yes. Vincent as a graduate student. Isn't that amazing? Everyone, look at that hair. Look at the beard. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hair. <laughs> I like hair. I used to like hair. Yep. <laughs> um, do we know why Artemis, do we know why some vaccines give more side effects than others to the same person? Hmm. I mean, everybody's immune response is individual, right? Because also our immune repertoire is individual. Everyone is different. We've all seen different pathogens. We all have different immune systems. Even though we have the same system, they're all trained differently. Yeah. So maybe that's why. Hmm? So Christopher was Roberta Palmore's graduate student in the McGill Faculty of Psychiatry. Okay. Oh, cool. Yeah, Angela, my nephew wants to be an astrophysicist. He's only 17 now in Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck. 17, which means he's going into first year. He's probably in grade 12, which is the last year of high school. So, How critical is correct host cell glycosylation of hemagglutinin for strong immunogenicity for an effective vaccine? <laughs> Yeah, you know, some of the flu vaccines are made in insect cells and glycosylation is different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the glycosylation is important for the folding of the protein, right? Um, but I'm not mm -hmm. sure. It's so, I mean, it can impact immunogenicity, obviously. Uh, it can interfere with antibody binding and so forth. But uh, I'm not aware of, uh, I don't know of any work that, that looks at it. Let's, let's Google it. Let's Google it. GSD bio. I'm pretty sure the... Per I think the person that is on G that is talking from GSD Bio yeah. is Jonathan, uh, and I actually met with him a few weeks ago um, over Zoom, and we talked about his work. It was really fun. So yeah, I think that's probably him or his co uh, or his um, there was somebody else I forget who that is also part of GSD Bio. Um, is that a company up, up up in Canada? No, they're in, I think they're in California. They're a startup okay. in California. Yeah. Yeah, he says, that's me. This mm -hmm. person you met, yep. He was very friendly. We talked about uh, flu in animal reservoirs and in birds and preventing 
certain spillovers during certain seasons, you know, the seasonality of flu and chickens and things like that. It was, it was a great conversation. Seen on a t-shirt, the universe is made up of protons, neutrons, electrons, and morons. <laughs> That's a good t-shirt, right? That's funny. Have you seen the documentary Virulent with Paul Offit and others about RFK Jr. and the anti-vax movement? They're having a showing for the public this weekend to pay off expenses for $15. I have not, but I'm thinking I have not. this would be a good thing to do. We could show this in a theater. It would be like a microbe TV event, you know, charge admission. And then we could have Paul Offit and whoever else was involved in the movie get up on stage and we can have a conversation afterwards. I bet people would come to see that. What do you think? I think so. I would go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm biased, but I would go. <laughs> I'd like to do more of those public events where we get people together, present something, and then they can talk about it. Then afterwards, we have a reception with them like we did for TWIV 1000, where you can mingle and talk to people. Mm. I'd, I would love to do more of those in uh, New York City. Yeah. Okay, let's see. <sighs> McGill University had Professor Penfield who worked on epilepsy and disconnecting the two hemispheres. Okay. Cool. Uh, Nick, Angela, is there any research on the cognitive ability of cats versus dogs? My mom's cat is pretty dumb, so I guess dogs are smarter <laughs> on average, but I get yelled at if I say that to some of my friends. <laughs> I mean, a fair that they get, that they yell at you. I mean, <laughs> I'm joking. But no, I think I'm also a dog person, so I'm also biased. But cognitive abilities, I mean, it is true that when you see, there are some dogs, I, I say dog because I feel like sometimes it's more apparent how intelligent dogs are, because mm. just training them, right? There are some abilities, some dogs have an extremely, like, they're extremely intelligent, like to learn, um, also some birds, even though birds, we can know now that people say, oh, you can teach your bird to talk. It's just really mimicking. It doesn't actually know what it's saying. Right. But dogs can actually like, I don't know if rationalize is the right, right word, but they're pretty, they're pretty smart. Some cats are as well. Uh, but I think that cats don't really show it as much. I mean, cats are, it's very difficult to say because cats, they just don't care about you or whatever you want to do. Cats just do their thing and they're like, I'll come to you if I want to. And if I don't, I'm going I'm to just chill over here. So with dogs, <laughs> they're a lot easier to, yeah. to handle. They're definitely more domesticated than cats. So I think that cats resistance to domestication hinders our ability to measure their level of cognitive abilities. <laughs> so, yeah. That to say, I think some dogs are smarter than other dogs, just like humans. Just some people are just smarter than other people. That's just, I mean, do they all have the same capacity? I don't know. Les, Les says cats train you. <laughs> true. I would say that's true. Yeah. All right. Will Everything's says, on their watch. <laughs> vaccine reactions. I never had any reactions. And then I had Shingrix laid me out for several days. Good to hear. It's highly effective. Uh, mm -hmm. So the reason why we have these differences, we don't know. Every, as Angela said, everybody's immune system is different, and uh, you can react to one vaccine and not another. Can I think of yeah. a vaccine that I had a bad reaction to? Um, I think the first Shingrix gave me a bit of a fever, but I just took some something and it was gone, so it wasn't a problem. Did you have... Um to Moderna, some people in like the first uh, Moderna shot had like a more, you know. Yeah, I did. My first was uh, Moderna. That might be it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Are there any rapid tests for farm animal viruses? Uh, rapid tests for farm animal, like a lateral flow antigen test. Uh, do we have any lateral flows? Farm animals? No. SARS. So. As far as I know, I shouldn't say that. As far as I know, no. But mm -hmm. for domestic animals, um, we do have, there are some, like for H. pylori, there's a lateral flow. For Helicobacter pylori, which affects the stomach, it can cause ulcers in animals, just like in humans, like a lot of humans. I think actually, I was talking about this with my partner recently, because he studies cancer. 
and H. pylori, he studies gastric cancer, gastroesophageal, and H. pylori is a risk factor for gastroesophageal cancer because of these, you know, well, there's ulcers and then it can, it hasn't been, I don't think the mechanism has been shown, but like a lot of, um, there's a high prevalence of people with H. pylori that also have these gastric, um, yeah. tumors. And, and yeah, there's a lateral flow for H. pylori because cats and dogs also get it a lot and it causes also, um, ulcers. What else? SARS-CoV-2 you could use on, but that would be on a cat or a dog, but not, uh, can't think of any in farm animals. The thing with farm animals is that we don't really test for a lot of things. Like normally in farm animals, you would be looking at if it's a cow, like mastitis, if the animal has mastitis or not. Um, if they have, like, you would just put them on antibiotics. Um, you put them a lot of the time on antibiotics prophylactically, unfortunately. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily be doing a lot of lateral flows on like production animals per se. All right. There's another one here. Um, Oh yes, yeah, Steph. Almost all cats in shelters have eye herpes simplex. A vet told me that when I adopted my kitty. Is that true, yeah. Angela? I'll, well, I mean, almost all. I think is a sh it's kind of it's a little strong, but it is true that it is transmissible, right? And that it, because it's transmissible yeah. in different secretions, and if you're in a high um, volume of there's a, a large volume of cats all agglomerated together in the same cages and things like that then there's definitely anything that's transmissible is going to be transmitted to all of the cats so yeah. yeah if in their shelter they have a lot of herpes incidents then yeah probably every other cat going in there is going to get it because there's going to be secretions like on their paws and then they touch things and there's fomites and you know get contaminated so what do you think about sheep and goat pox. <laughs> goat po I don't know enough about goat pox to say. <laughs> Bridge probably knows more about goat pox. Sheep and goat pox. Well, I mean, a lot of uh, viruses between sheep and goat, um, there's cross transmission. Like there's cross, uh, they can infect both. So if it's goat pox that it can affect a sheep, that's not surprising. I mean, it can probably affect, I think it also infects cows actually. Um, let's see goat pox yeah sheep and sheep pox goat pox mm -hmm. similar to cow pox i wonder how specific it is though yeah, yeah. see these are like yeah. these random viruses that i don't really know a lot about because the, i don't think the incidence is that high at least not here like when i've uh, when i learned about it like in europe and spain uh oh lumpy skin disease Oh, they're Capri pox virus. Oh, that's cute because like Capri mm. comes from yeah. goat. That's just... good. Yep. Oh, there you go. Capri pox virus. I love that. <laughs> yep, it's good. All right. I'm Vista sure wants to bit. know why do dogs get age related disease like arthritis and cataracts after just 10 years when humans are made of the same blood and bone materials? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to remember that 10 years in a dog is a lot older than 10 years in a person, right? So 10 years in a dog, people like to say this whole seven, what is it? What do they say? Seven years, or I forget what people say. Seven years, every seven years of a human is like one year in a dog or something like that, yeah. which I think is hard to say. I don't really like that um, when people say that. But if an animal is only going to live, let's say 10, 12 years, and by 10 years old, it has, you know, arthritis and all of these things that humans have when they're 80, then if your average human lives until they're, let's say 86, then that would make sense, right? The tissues just, especially if it's like a heavy yeah. dog, arthritis and, and these things, dysplasia, hip dysplasia is normally in giant breeds because that's just a lot of weight on their bones for a very long time. And a lot of them are also congenital. So we know mm. that hip dysplasia, like in, um, and what are they called? Oh, wow, I'm blanking. In German Shepherds. So German Shepherds are literally bred with like a downward slope on their pelvis. So they're bred kind of mis, I don't wanna say like misformed, but it's, it's, it's a birth defect that we select for. 
and we know that that's going to cause the animal problems but because aesthetically it's it's pleasing to those that want german shepherds and that's part of the breed that's part of the phenotype mm. um we do this same thing with brachiocephalic breeds so like we know that french bulldogs and pugs and all of these animals are going to have extremely difficult times extremely difficult uh breathing they have stenotic nares so their their noses are like tiny little holes they have collapsed tracheas they have these huge soft palates which is why when people say that they sound cute when they're breathing well it's literally because they can't breathe it's not like they're like oh the like snorting is cute it's like a pig well that's literally because their soft palate is covering their mm -hmm. airway and the air has to force itself in and out so these animals literally can't run in the summertime because their soft palate gets there's get edema and then they can collapse because they stop breathing because their airways has so much edema it can no longer air can no longer circulate so there's a lot of things in animals in like purebreds that we select for that i i am a supporter of uh mixed breed species if you want an animal to live long and health like a healthy long-lived animal get a mutt no joke like mutts live the longest they have the least problems like it's crazy how we we choose breeds and we're like, okay, I'm gonna get a, I don't know, a King Charles Spaniel. And you know that your dog is gonna have like 95% chance of having a mitral valve defect. Like it's mm -hmm. gonna have a heart problem and it's probably gonna die when it's young of a heart disease. Why would you ever get this dog? Why would you pay for this dog? Like, I know as a vet, I shouldn't say that because a lot of people are like, oh, we want like these breeds. And <laughs> I don't agree with any of this whole like breedism and uh, yeah. <laughs> It's a, I could rant a long time about that. So, <laughs> so Chris has a black lab, 1.6 years old with a persistent ear infection. Any suggestions? Oh yeah. Otitis. So yeah, otitis is, so I would say black labs, uh, try to keep the ear as dry as possible. If you're don't bathe him, like if you're bathing him and his head, don't submerge it in water. So what you want to do is you want to try to prevent moisture in the ear. So a lot of this otitis is probably this fungus called malassezia, and it's all, it, most of the time it's fungus and bacteria. It's like both. It's fungal bacterial. Um, and keeping a dry environment is really w important. So if anything is like humid, that's just going to, it's going to just proliferate more and more. So I don't know if your dog like goes swimming in lakes or if you bathe him. I know a lot of people bathe their dogs almost monthly. I don't partake in this. I only bathe my dog if he's like smells terrible and it's like he smells fine most of the time. I only bathe him like once every four four months probably. Um, so as for the otitis, it would be to try to keep his ear as clean as possible, like as dry, I should say. Uh, even like every night, just like passing like a swab, like a little cotton swab in the ear, like to just remove any sort of excess humidity. Uh, or like discharge, like build up, even before he gets the otitis, just like preventatively cleaning his ears will help. Cause especially dogs that have like floppy ears, it creates like an anaerobic environment, which is why they're more prone to otitis than dogs that have like perky ears because there's, you know, air circulating and these bacteria and fungi that want to grow in anaerobic, like in a non-oxygen environment can't do that if the ear is open. So that's why closed and wet is bad open and dry is good. <laughs> what uh, do you know somebody called Bernardo Mingarelli? That's my brother. <laughs> yeah, he's he's here. He's, he's yeah, yeah, he he told me he was uh he was listening and Oliviana and I think my boyfriend is also in the chat somewhere. <laughs> well, if you're here, they all came to listen. Hit the like button, folks. Uh it helps And also to, uh... donate. Donate at Venmo. <laughs> and like, donate, oh. please. <laughs> You, yeah, you can donate down. There's a button below the, the, the video. You could do that, or you could go to Venmo at Microbe TV. Give us some money so we can keep doing this. But uh, but if you don't want to do any of that, just hit the like button because we it really helps us to get um, yes more, more people here. John wants to know, uh, what are some notable differences in immune systems of domesticated animals and humans, just the ones we consider pets? Um. Notable differences. Okay, so we know that cats and dogs have B cells, T cells, and K cells. All the fun stuff we have, they have. They have the innate immune system is mostly similar. I think it, it hasn't been as studied as humans, so we can't say if everything is the same. 
Uh, for example, like if they have rig eye receptors and if like mm. the TLRs are all of the same, I don't know um, if like innate sensing is the same, but um, grossly in immune cells, we know that they have macrophages and dendritic cells and all of these things. And that a lot of the drugs, as we were talking about before, that can be used in humans can also be used in other mammals. Remember that uh, a lot of clinical trials before we go into humans were in animals, right? We're in mice, yeah. we're in ferrets, we're sometimes in cats. So there's different animal models that you can use, uh, hamsters, non-human primates. So um, definitely they are close enough, especially cats. A lot of people don't know that cats are used in research as well. So um we do know that yes some of these domestic species do have very similar immune systems to humans which is why we can use them as as models for for different drugs or for you know different immune uh, studies like research on different parts of the immune system so mm. so yeah avian species if we go into like other things that aren't mammals then whole other story but within mammals more or less um we can say more or less it's similar. Patricia said, my niece's cat has herpes in his eyes. Is it contagious to humans? Mm, I mean, if it's the herpes simplex, like the one, uh, you would have to, I don't know. Hmm. We would have to know which herpes virus it is, but normally, no, those that affect cats don't affect humans. Um, okay. But but we can't say that for sure, right? We would need to know what the virus is specifically because just saying herpes in the eyes, I know that a lot of the time we say like there's herpetic lesions and you can say, oh, it's herpes, but we don't actually know which virus it is, right? Um, but most of the time they're not zoonotic uh, herpes viruses. They're specific, they're more like host specific. Um, so Visto said, my dog vomits his breakfast and eats it. Why, is this the sign of a problem? <laughs> <laughs> He's probably eating what, first of all, what breed of dog do you have? If he has some like huge lab that is so excited to eat his food, then he's probably just eating too fast. So a lot of dogs just eat way too fast and they vomit their food because it's literally just, they feel their, like, imagine if we sat down and we had a whole pizza and we ate it in like two minutes, literally. Cause that's what dogs do, right? You give them their whole bowl and they sometimes don't chew. Some dogs literally just like inhale the kibble. My dog does that too, and he'll vomit sometimes. So a good thing for dogs that are very anxious when eating, if they eat really quickly, there's these like feeding mats that you can buy that the kibble falls in between. It's almost like a like a little labyrinth. Like it's there's like mm. grooves in it. So the animals have to eat like the pieces out of it and it takes them longer to eat. And I would suggest that like a lot mm. of vets suggest those for um, for anxious eaters, like for fast dogs that eat really quickly, that way they they're forced to eat slowly because they have to like kind of work for their food around like these little it kind of looks like a maze. It's like a dog food maze. If you can, you can just Google them. They're they're used a lot in especially labs, labs, golden retrievers, labradoodles, poodles. They're so excited when they eat, and because they're also large breed, you don't want them consuming like huge volumes of food very quickly because then we talk about this whole gastric distension and volvulus, which is like the spinning on itself. Mm. Um, so yeah, try the labyrinth, the food maze. <laughs> uh, let's see. I thought there was one here. Yes, uh, what causes spinal stroke in dogs? <laughs> <laughs> spinal stroke? I don't know what they're referring to. I mean, spinal stroke, well, stroke is just some sort of infarction of some sort. So this could mean many things. Um, if they're hmm. referring to like wiener dogs that have a lot of spinal problems that can have like herniated discs, because like, people sometimes use the word stroke broadly, like meaning more things than it actually means, but maybe they mean um, like if an animal has paresis of its like hind legs, that can be because of like a slip disc or things like that. If they're referring to that, which can happen in like chondroplastic breeds. So breeds that have, um, problems with like developing their cartilage and things like that, like, uh, dachshund. So wiener dogs, they have terrible problems with this, with like their, their spines. Also French bulldogs, a lot of the time have problems with their spines. They have these intervertebral discs, herniations also. Um, yeah, if they're referring to that, if not, please specify. <laughs> uh, 
John wants to know if we're no longer tracking COVID variants. Yeah, you can still find at covariants.org. There's also a wastewater site that Daniel mentions every week where they look at the variants in the wastewater. So, uh, yes, people are still tracking. I mean, obviously there are fewer tests being done now, so it's not as good as it was before, but they're still being tracked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Angela, is there a disadvantage when a poodle has deep set eyes? A disadvantage. Uh, <laughs> this is, I mean, maybe they could have more um, discharge in the actual eye. So the only thing with animals that have like deep set eyes, also like Persian cats, like I mean, or certain certain breeds that have deep set eyes, you have to just make sure that you clean out the the discharge from like their tears, basically. Um, just mm -hmm. make sure to clean it out because if not, it can get like really crusty and, and gross. Basically you just clean, you just want to make sure that their eyes stay clean. Um, cause you don't want to clog their lacrimal canal, which goes like from their eye into their nose. Um, so maybe only that they can see just as fine. There's no problem. They're not like, they don't have impaired vision or anything like that. That's just, that's just the way they're made. Sylvia Pina, thank you for your support of science communication. Feline hyperesthesia. There seems to be very little research on it. I found a paper from Barcelona. Any leads? Do you know what this is, Angela? Feline, Feline hyperesthesia. hyperesthesia. I actually don't. Um, I mean, I can infer from its name, but let's see. Hmm. Hyperesthesia syndrome in cats. Interesting. Hmm. Rolling skin disease. Uh, okay, so it affects the endocrine system. No, I don't know a lot about this. Self-mutilate. Yeah, cats that are self-mutilating. So did she say that she knew someone with, hyper, with feline hyperesthesia? No. No, I just hmm. was looking for something on it. Well, I think a lot of these these syndromes in cats, so there's obviously this is now given a name, feline hyperesthesia syndrome, but I don't think that it's well described. So I don't think there's a lot of research on it because it's something that maybe a couple of vets have described and they share mm. this common knowledge, but that it's not something that's there's been any sort of mechanism defined or any sort of like um viral or bacterial agent uh etiological agent involved in it it just seems like a like a combination of multiple symptoms that then they define as feline hyperesthesia which does happen a lot in veterinary and even human medicine right like you say the combination of these symptoms we can define it as x um, but yeah, we don't necessarily yeah. know what those mean. We just try to treat them symptomatically. So you can treat, if the cat is really nervous, you can try to give it like, let's say gabapentin or some sort of drug that will calm them down. Um, so yeah, you would just treat them with symptomatically as far as I can see. Um, here, uh, this is pretty funny. <laughs> my older son stayed with my parents on the farm during <clears throat> first year of law school. He was shocked the first time he saw my dad's arm halfway up a cow's butt. No. I'm sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. You get used to it. <laughs> the evacuation uh, part takes the most tedious part. <laughs> okay. Um, this next one, I'm going to show some slides. This, what types of animals can prions inf infect other than a deer or cow quite a few actually uh humans oh, yeah. of course don't forget humans uh -huh. but mink Critsfield jacob um mm -hmm. uh, uh various also wildlife. well here uh here sheep go. and goats so scrapey is, is a prionic goats, right? yeah scrapey uh, is what it's it, called in sheep and here's a slide let me show you a slide from my course we'll do a screen share Oh, nice. There it is. <clears throat> TSC diseases of animals. So we have cows, we have deer, elk, and moose. We have niala and greater kudu, domestic and great cats, sheep and goats, minks, and of course uh, humans is on that list mm -hmm. as well. And that's what we know of. Who knows, right? Could be more. Yeah, in in humans, it's Critchfield Jacob disease, right? That's what it's called. I that's think. one of them. It's one, one of, of several, hmm. actually. There's Kreutzfeldt Jakob, and there is. Mm -hmm. um, Kuru, of course, which was mm -hmm. the first one found in the, in the four people caused by cannibalism. And then there's Gerstmann-Straussler, 
syndrome. There is um, fatal familial insomnia. So they're all different human TSEs with different pathologies. Very interesting. And are these also spontaneous, like in cattle? They can, because in humans, I have no idea. I know in cows, um, <clears throat> they can be spontaneous. And mm -hmm. is it the same in humans? Can be spontaneous, or they can be acquired by eating contaminated mm -hmm. foods or getting transplants with contaminated products or materials. So a lot of corneal transplants gave uh, these prion diseases to people before we knew they were there, right? Mm hmm <laughs> Okay, let's see. We have six minutes left here. Let's find um, some some interesting questions. Well, they're all interesting, of course. Yeah, Tona that's true. says, I'm Good late. Morning. You're the best, Angela. You're courageous with your free diving. Ah, thank you. You should try it out, but always with certifi certified people. Be careful. <laughs> <clears throat> What's your favorite EDM DJ? Oh, well, it's, it's funny. I don't have one favorite. <clears throat> I have several. Right. <laughs> so I'll share my um, YouTube thing. I'm well, a here. So we have Chris Luno, Miss Monique, and Garcy. I really like them. Those are the ones I've been listening to a, a lot lately. So I actually I went to see Miss Monique in Washington D.C. seven months ago in concert. And I, I made a little video of her, which is right here on my YouTube channel. But oh, Chris nice. Luno, Miss Monique, and Garcy, I really like. Um, so, and is there I'm a um, go listen. is there a TWIV EDM playlist, Jill? <clears throat> I should really make one because I have a lot of uh, ones that I like. So, I actually made a a top twenty songs, the songs I love. Right? It's on my What's YouTube. What's your number channel. one, Vincent? Do you have a number one? Uh, all time favorite song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where is that list? Let me let me see if I can find it. Uh, <laughs> it's among my videos, right? How, how do I find? Let's see. You go let's to see. YouTube Studio to try and find my playlist. Playlists? It would be a playlist, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you have so many. Let's see. Uh, oh, there's one in no, not favorites. Interviews with scientists. I don't see any on music. Uh, top songs. I don't know what I called it. I can't even forget it. Remember, uh, I actually I picked it on songs? Twiv. I picked it on Twiv once. Um, uh, as so, I made a playlist of top uh, songs that I like, and mm -hmm. I can't find. I can't find it right now. But, I can't uh, find it either. Oh, I will try and find it, and I should uh, ask, add some EDM for sure. Yeah. Let's see. You can post it on microbe TV. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> oh, Steve in, in Hawaii got his stickers. Yeah, I so Steve asked me, and I just mailed them the other day in Hawaii, and he got them. If anyone wants stickers, you can just send an email to Vincent at microbe.tv. I'll send you a couple <laughs> by mail. I got a whole bunch. Our lab is full of microbe TV stickers now. It's amazing. Yeah, and my I phone, look. Yeah, it's great. I gave a bunch out in, in your place. Uh, it's a lot of people, so you should see a bunch around. Yeah. Um, I love Richard Feynman. Yeah, he was a great physicist, really good at teaching people as well. Mm -mm. Um, Angela, do you crave returning to living in uh, a warm climate? Yes, although I have to say, Montreal, I kind of... I think because I lived far, I lived in, in the Canary Islands for 15 years and there's not really a lot of seasons there. Like it's, it's kind of like always between 18 and 25, which I know sounds a lot of people like, oh, poor you, but it's actually really nice to see, you know, the change of the leaves and the winter and snow and spring. It's, I really enjoy seasons like, and I actually really enjoy the snow as well. So do I miss it? Yes, normally I miss it in January. Hmm. January end of January is when winter really starts like hitting you hard in Montreal from middle of January to like April, <laughs> March <laughs> to like March. It's like two and a half months that it's a little bit difficult. And then, and then it gets warmer. And once we go from like minus 30 to minus 10, we're like out in sweaters. We're like, Oh, this isn't even cold. So then things you start seeing, you know, flowers and leaves. So I like the season zone. I like the winter. I think it's, it's beautiful, especially, you know, you can go skiing and snowboarding and tobogganing and snowshoeing and it's just fun. 
So here is um, Bernardo, is your brother there. Oh, what's up, Bernardo? I call him Nato Benz. Bernardo is a, uh, actually, he's a professor at um, Ottawa U of Classics. He teaches Latin. There you go. There you go. He just said that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let's see um, if there's anything else here that we should, anyone else we should thank. All right. That'll do it for another Office Hours. I want to thank our moderators tonight for joining us. Les, Tom, Steph, Vanity Nutrition, Barb Mac UK. Uh, I mentioned Les, yes. Thank you all for being here and keeping us civilized. Thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. Uh, and uh, Angela, yeah, thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thank you, Angela. For wonderful for questions. Coming. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Vincent. Yeah. Wonderful questions. Wonderful time here. I will definitely come back if you want me again, Vincent. And if the people want me, if you call me back, we'll I'm be sure. here. I'm sure they, <laughs> they would want you back. Absolutely. So uh, this guy, Tom, wants to know, Angela, is your pops the Carlton mathematician? Is that your Yes. Pop? Yes. He's at Carlton. He teaches calculus to all the engineers. He's wow. actually within Carlton, like famous as... Uh, within all the engineers because he teaches like first and second year calculus and he's he doesn't want to retire anytime soon and he's 70 and he's loving it so yeah this was a great episode Angela we'll have you back I'm sure people would love to see you again and I'm just sorry that more people don't take advantage of it you know we had 200 people that's great but really there mm -hmm. should be thousands because it, it teaches everybody science and who else would talk about where to stand next to a horse so you don't get kicked, you know? <laughs> this is important information to have, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I have way uh, more stories for next time. Lots of anecdotes. All right. Well, <laughs> we'll bring it back soon. Uh, we will be back next week. Uh, that is... Well, you can figure it out, but it is um, November 15th at 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I don't know if it'll be me or uh, me with someone else. I have to think about it. I always get somebody at the last minute. I mean, I asked you last week, mm -hmm. right, Angela, while we were in Montreal. Yeah. But in the meantime, everyone, stay safe and uh, have a great week. Good night. Bye, guys.